our very own Dr. Loazi Lushaba. When we were fighting, he was Dr. When he left here after fighting, he left with his professorship. He's now Professor Loazi Lushaba. When he went to the University of Cape Town, he didn't go there and solve the revolution. He continued. He carried the mandate from here. He shook whiteness there. Loazi Lushaba. Amanda! 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 Long live the spirit of Solomon Matangu! Long live! Long live the spirit of Solomon Matangu! Long live! Long live the spirit of Amalka Cabral! Long live! Long live the spirit of Eduardo Monzane! Long live! Long live the spirit of Mwali Munyerere, long live Amanda! Fellow black people, I thank you very much for this opportunity to converse with you about the experiences of black people in white institutions. You perhaps think that you know it being at VETS and VETS being a white institution. I want to bring you an experience from a thorough-going white institution called University of Cape Town. If you think that you have encountered whiteness at VETS, you only need to go to the University of Cape Town to know the arrogance and brutality of whiteness. In this country, black people constitute 86% of the population. At UCT, black South Africans constitute only 19% of the student population. That's a university in South Africa in 2016 where black people who, as we've said, constitute 86% of the population, there they only constitute 19%. Now there is a reason why UCT has maintained this. It's the same reason that VETS maintains whiteness in another form. It is that what has happened in South Africa the task of intellectual production and the task of thinking has been made an exclusive preserve of white people. So that every time these institutions have to make an appointment, white people in one swan song sing and say that but there are no black South Africans applying. So if UCT is not producing them, if VETS is not producing them, who has the responsibility to? So there is a deliberate project by these institutions to keep us out of the task of thinking and intellectual production so that even our lives, our black lives, can get written about by white academics. And in that process, so they can turn our suffering and our existential misery into a commodity. Because what happens when they write about us, all kinds of things about us, Deep Sloat, um, all kinds of books they write about black people, they then get promoted. But those about whom they are writing remain in their misery and squalor. So it means that our misery and squalor is a platform or is a step ladder for white academics to rise through these institutions. 
But it is not only that they want to use our misery for their own promotion. It is also that because they are accustomed to a situation where black people are spoken about, where black people do not speak for themselves, but they are spoken about. When we try to decolonize the teaching in these institutions and in our classrooms and bring black voices into these classrooms, we are told by these white institutions that we were not teaching, but we were mobilizing. And so it happens that at UCT, I invite RMF comrades into my politics class. Now what is politics? It is precisely what we are doing here. But because they want me to teach about Weber, Marx and all other European men, when I invite RMF activists to come and enlighten students about the process and the task of decolonizing the academy. UCT then responds by slamming me with a warning letter, claiming that what I did amounted to dereliction of duty. Now the point is simply that these white institutions do not imagine or never prefigured a time when black academics would be standing in the classroom. That's the first problem. So I was told that that racist head of department called Anthony Butler, he claimed to have received complaints from students in my class now there's something i want to bring to the fore for you here why would a student in my class when i'm present throughout if he or she does not understand what is going on why would the student jump me and go to speak to a white head of department you know why it is because i'm not real I'm a proxy as a black academic standing in front of them. I'm transparent. They can see me through me. So they expect me to perform a certain role that otherwise appropriately belongs to a white person. And so what I had done was basically to refuse to perform that role as they had expected. And the student, the white students who complained, knew very well that they wouldn't have to do any convincing because as white people, as a white student talking to a white head of department, they are both agreed on the project of keeping black people out of the academy. So what is happening here is not just an incident, you know, about relations between a junior academic and a senior academic it is that these white institutions that have normalized a certain norm that have made whiteness a norm will do everything possible to ensure that they defend that norm and white people do not need a mass meeting they do not need a workshop to convince each other. The project is common to them. They all subscribe to it. So for us, when we encounter them or when we confront whiteness, we confront an institution that also has agents between the institutional culture and the institution and these agents, there is unanimity on what needs to be done. It is precisely that that we have to disrupt. The task of decolonizing 
the higher education institutions in this country, the task of decolonizing the curriculum in this country simply means that we have to break this unholy alliance between white academics and white institutions. We have to remind them that these institutions are funded by the taxes that are paid by the poor black people in this country. It is our mothers and our fathers who every day pay vet that sustain these institutions. These institutions are a common good. So they must behave in a manner that is reflective of the aspirations of this country. So why is it that these institutions simply refuse to do a simple thing? I would have expected vice chancellors in this country to say that it seems like society has moved ahead of us. It seems like students in South Africa have diagnosed the problems of this country better than we have done. So let us simply join forces with them and make this a society where we can all cohabit. But for some inexplicable reason, Max Price at UCT, Habib Adam at Vets, and other vice chancellors have taken on a role that does not belong to them. Why are you defending government? You are not government. Simply step aside if it's hard to join us and say that government provide us with resources so that we can educate the nation. Now you have professors who head these institutions who supposedly are an epitome of thinking from whom we must see creativity. And they are very loud when they have to criticize government for its intellectual poverty. They are very loud when they have to point the intellectual poverty of the government. But in the way in which they have responded to genuine protests, we haven't seen any difference between them and this anti-black government that we have. So when they criticize government when it responds violently to service delivery protest, what is different between that and what they are doing? So it means that if this country has a leadership problem, that leadership problem is not confined to the political realm. These institutions themselves are settled by a serious problem of leadership crisis. We need, at the head of these institutions, people who can display capability for thought. People who can display capability for creatively imagining a different society than the unjust society that we live in today. Now, it would seem to me that, unfortunately, there is no difference, as we've said, between the anti-black government we have and the heads of these institutions, the professors who are supposed to be, you know, the epitome of thinking, because they respond with violence also when we protest. It means that they agree with government that the only way in which you can converse with black people is through violence because they are objects. Now, it's in centuries since discourse constructed us as black people, as people who are available for all kinds of dispensability. You can dispense with black people, you shoot 36 of them or 39 of them in Marikana and life moves on. Because black people are many and dispensable. You shoot them in the institutions of higher learning and life continues. They must just realize that at the base of our struggles, we are asking for a simple thing. We also want to be human. 
Just as it is that if those 36 miners were white, we know what would have happened. We also know that if many of the students who are protesting, if they were white, we wouldn't have seen this police brutality that we are seeing. The simple reason why that has not happened is because we are not considered human. So at the heart of our struggles, we want to be human in our own country. We haven't gone to any other person's country to ask for this. We are asking for it in our own country. What is justice then if it's not that? So, as we continue with these struggles, I think that we can borrow a leaf from those who have struggled before us. You know, in Tanzania, when Mwalimu Nyerere led the people of Tanzania, he insisted that freedom was going to be meaningless unless it was freedom accompanied by education. He insisted that freedom was going to be empty if freedom was not accompanied by work. So the Tanzanians declared freedom and work, freedom and education, freedom and wealth, freedom and culture as the cardinal principles of their struggle. We want to be a cultured people. It can't be that in a country where we are a majority, our cultures anywhere in the program appear somewhere towards the end. It's one rendition. And then after that, we return to the norm of whiteness. It must be the other way around. Whiteness must feature as a footnote in our lives. It, it has been too long. It has been too long with us going through an education that alienates us from our languages. It's been too long that we've gone through an education system that alienates us from our people. It's been too long that we've gone through an education system that alienates us from our cultures, such that when we've graduated at VETS, at UCT, for no reason but because we hold that piece of paper that, satisfy, that certifies us as people who've gone through Western education, we then think that we have a license to speak ill of our cultures. We then begin to speak ill of those we've left behind. We say they have not evolved, they are not modern enough. These are generations that brought us up. These are generations that make it possible for us to be where we are. All of a sudden, when we've gone through VETS and UCT, we think that they are backward. So we want an education system that does not suggest that you have to come into VETS from Alex, from Soweto, but when, we live, when you live here, you go to the white suburbs. You leave behind your own people. When you go to the white suburbs, whose problems are you going to solve? White people's problems? They don't have problems. So we want an education system that will infuse us with enthusiasm and energy to go back to Soweto, to Alex, to resolve problems that we left behind there. Because there will be something wrong when at the end of your four-year degree at VETS at UCT, you begin to think that that kind of existence is not fit for you. If it's not fit for you, who is it fit for? 
it means that if you say it's not fit for you there are black people that should go through that existence but not you what distinguishes you from those people it is that you aspire to whiteness But we know very well, we know very well that it doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter what effort you put in. Whiteness will always elude you. At an appropriate moment, white people will remind you that you are trying so hard. At an appropriate moment, white people are going to say to you, why is it that black people, but I don't mean you, I mean black people. And so we must not, we must not, we must not forsake our people. We must remain one with our people. We must never forsake our cultures and begin to speak ill of our cultures. We must end this education. Black people in this country have no wealth. You know the only wealth they have? It's you and I. We provide them with the only hope and possibility. If we let them down, no one else is going to help them out of this misery. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Institutions. You perhaps think that you know it being at VETS and VETS being a white institution. I want to bring you an experience from a thorough-going white institution called University of Cape Town. If you think that you have encountered whiteness at VETS, you only need to go to the University of Cape Town to know the arrogance and brutality of whiteness. In this country, black people constitute 86% of the population. At UCT, black South Africans constitute only 19% of the student population. That's a university in South Africa in 2016, where black our very own Dr. Loazi Lushaba. When we were fighting, he was doctor. When he left here after fighting, he left with his professorship. He's now Professor Loazilushab. When he went to the University of Cape Town, he didn't go there and solve the revolution. He continued. He carried the mandate from here. He shook whiteness there. Loazilushab. Amanda! Amanda! People who, as we've said, constitute 86% of the population, there they only constitute 19%. Now there is a reason why UCT has maintained this. It's the same reason that VETS maintains whiteness in another form. It is that what has happened in South Africa, the task of intellectual production and the task of thinking has been made an exclusive preserve of white people. So that every time these institutions have to make an appointment, white people in one swan song sing and say that but there are no black South Africans applying. So if UCT is not producing them, if VETS is not producing them, who has the responsibility to? 
So there is a deliberate project by these institutions to keep us out of the task of thinking and intellectual production so that even our lives, our black lives, can get written about by white academics. And in that process, so they can turn our suffering and our existential misery into a commodity. Because what happens when they write about us, all kinds of things about us, deep slot, um, all kinds of books they write about black people, they then get promoted. But those about whom they are writing remain in their misery and squalor. So it means that our misery and squalor is a platform or is a step ladder for white academics to rise through these institutions. But it is not only the Amanda, Amanda, long live the spirit of Solomon Matangu, long live, long live the spirit of Solomon Matangu, long live. Long live the spirit of Amalka Cabral, long live. Long live the spirit of Eduardo Monzane, long live. Long live the spirit of Muali Munyerere, long live. Amanda! Fellow black people, I thank you very much for this opportunity to converse with you about the experiences of black people in white.